Good evening. You are listening to Booked for the Night, a nightly podcast that brings you the classics. I'm your host, Melissa Phillips. Tonight I'm reading chapters 15 through 17 of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Enjoy. Chapter 15. The business was practically settled from the moment I never followed him. It was a pitiful surrender to agitation, but my being aware of this had somehow no power to restore me. I only sat there on my tomb and read into what our young friend had said to me, the fullness of its meaning. By the time I had grasped the whole of which I had also embraced for absence, the pretext that I was ashamed to offer my pupils and the rest of the congregation such an example of delay. What I said to myself above all was that Miles had got something out of me and that the gauge of it for him would be just this awkward collapse. He had got out of me that there was something I was much afraid of and that he should probably be able to make use of my fear to gain, for his own purpose, more freedom. My fear was of having to deal with the intolerable question of the grounds of his dismissal from school, since that was really but the question of the horrors gathered behind. That his uncle should arrive to treat me with these things was a solution that, strictly speaking, I ought now to have desired to bring on, but I could so little face the ugliness and the pain of it that I simply procrastinated and lived from hand to mouth. The boy, to my deep discomposure, was immensely in the right, was in a position to say to me, either you clear up with my guardian the mystery of this interruption of my studies, or you cease to expect me to lead with you a life that's so unnatural for a boy." What was so unnatural for the particular boy I was concerned with was the sudden revelation of a consciousness and a plan. That was what really overcame me, what prevented my going in. I walked around the church, hesitating, hovering. I reflected that I had already, with him, hurt myself beyond repair. Therefore, I could patch up nothing, and it was too extreme an effort to squeeze beside him into the pew. He would be so much more sure than ever to pass his arm into mine and make me sit there for an hour in close, mute contact with his commentary on our talk. For the first minute since his arrival, I wanted to get away from him. As I paused beneath the high east window and listened to the sound of worship, I was taken with an impulse that might master me, I felt, and completely, should I give it the least encouragement. I might easily put an end to my ordeal by getting away altogether. Here was my chance. There was no one to stop me. I could give the whole thing up, turn my back, and bolt. It was only a question of hurrying again for a few preparations to the house which the attendants at church of so many of the servants would practically have left unoccupied. No one, in short, could blame me if I should just drive desperately off. What was it to get away if I should get away only until dinner? What would be in a couple of hours at the end of which... I had the acute provision, my little pupils would play at innocent wonder about my non-appearance in their train. What did you do, you naughty bad thing? Why in the world to worry us so and take our thoughts off too, don't you know? Did you desert us at the very door? I couldn't meet such questions, nor, as they asked them, their false little lovely eyes. Yet it was also exactly what I should have to meet that, as the prospect grew sharp to me, I at last let myself go. I got so far as the immediate moment was concerned away. I came straight out of the churchyard and, thinking hard, retraced my steps through the park. It seemed to me that by the time I reached the house, I had made up my mind to cynical flight. The Sunday stillness, both of the approaches and of the interior, in which I met no one, fairly stirred me with a sense of opportunity. Were I to get off quickly this way, I should get off without a scene without a word. My quickness would have to be remarkable, however, and the question of a conveyance was the great one to settle. Tormented in the hall with difficulties and obstacles, I remember sinking down at the foot of the staircase, suddenly collapsing there on the lowest step, and then, with a revulsion, recalling that it was exactly where, more than a month before, in the darkness of night and just so bowed with evil things, I had seen the specter of the most horrible of women." At this, I was able to straighten myself. I went the rest of the way up. I made in my turmoil for the schoolroom, where there were objects belonging to me that I should have to take. But I opened the door to find again, in a flash, my eyes unsealed. In the presence of what I saw, I reeled straight back upon resistance. Seated at my own table in the clear noonday light, I saw a person whom, 
Without my previous experience, I should have taken at the first blush for some housemaid who might have stayed at home to look after the place and who, availing herself of real relief from observation and of the schoolroom table and my pens, ink and paper, had applied herself to the considerable effort of a letter to her sweetheart. There was an effort in the way that, while her arms rested on the table, her hands, with evident weariness, supported her head. But at the moment I took this in, I had already become aware that, in spite of my entrance, her attitude strangely persisted. Then it was, with the very act of its announcing itself, that her identity flared up in a change of posture. She rose, not as if she had heard me, but with an indescribable grand melancholy of indifference and detachment, and, within a dozen feet of me, stood there as my vile predecessor. Dishonored and tragic, she was all before me. But even as I fixed and, for memory, secured it, the awful image passed away. Dark as midnight in her black dress, her haggard beauty and her unutterable woe, she had looked at me long enough to appear to say that her right to sit at my table was as good as mine to sit at hers. While these instants lasted, indeed, I had the extraordinary chill of a feeling that it was I who was the intruder. It was as a, it was as a wild protest against it that, actually addressing her, "'You terrible, miserable woman!' I heard myself break into a sound that, by the open door, rang through the long passage and the empty house. She looked at me as if she heard me, but I had recovered myself and cleared the air. There was nothing in the room the next minute but the sunshine and the sense that I must stay. Chapter 16 I had so perfectly expected the return of the others to be marked by a demonstration that I was freshly upset at having to find them merely dumb and discreet about my desertion. Instead of gaily denouncing and caressing me that they made no allusion to my having failed them, and I was left for the time on perceiving that she too said nothing to study Mrs. Gross's old face. I did this to such purpose that I made sure they had in some way bribed her to silence, a silence that, however, I would engage to break down on the first private opportunity. This opportunity came before tea. I secured five minutes with her in the housekeeper's room, where in the twilight, amid a smell of lately baked bread, but with the place all swept and garnished, I found her sitting in pained placidity before the fire. So I see her still, so I see her best, facing the flame from her straight chair in the dusky shining room, a large clean picture of the put away, of drawers closed and locked and rest without a remedy. Oh yes, they asked me to say nothing and to please them, so long as they were there, of course I promised. But what had happened to you? I only went with you for the walk, I said. I had them to come back to meet a friend. She showed her surprise. A friend? You? Oh yes, I've a couple, I laughed. But the children give you a reason? For not alluding to your leaving us? Yes, they said you'd like it better. Do you like it better? My face had made her rueful. No, I like it worse. But after an instant, I added, Did they say why I should like it better? No, Master Miles only said we must do nothing but what she likes. I wish indeed he would. And what did Flora say? Miss Flora was too sweet. She said, Oh, of course, of course. And I said the same. I thought a moment. You were too sweet, too. I can hear you all. But nonetheless, between Miles and me, it's now all out. All out? My companion stared. But what, miss? Everything. It doesn't matter. I've made up my mind. I came home, my dear, I went on, for a talk with Miss Jessel. I had by this time formed the habit of having Mrs. Gross literally well in hand in advance of my sounding that note, so that even now, as she bravely blinked under the signal of my word, I could keep her comparatively firm. A talk? Do you mean she spoke? It came to that. I found her on my return in the schoolroom. And what did she say? I can hear the good, good woman still, and the candor of her stupefaction that she suffers the torments. It was this of a truth that made her, as she filled out my picture, gape. Do you mean, she faltered, of the lost? Of the lost, of the damned, and that's why to share them. 
I faltered myself with the horror of it. But my companion, with less imagination, kept me up. To share them. She wants Flora. Mrs. Gross might, as I gave it to her, fairly have fallen away from me had I not been prepared. I still held her there to show I was. As I've told you, however, it doesn't matter. Because you've made up your mind. But to what? To everything. And what do you call everything? Why, to sending for their uncle. Oh, miss, and pity do, my friend broke out. Ah, but I will, I will. I see it's the only way. What's out, as I told you with Miles, is that if he thinks I'm afraid to, and has idea of what he gains by that, he shall see he's mistaken. Yes, yes, his uncle shall have it here for me on the spot, and before the boy himself, if necessary, that if I'm to be reproached with having done nothing again more about school. Yes, miss, my companion pressed me. Well, there's that awful reason. There were now clearly so many of these for my poor colleague that she was excusable for being vague. But, uh, which? Why, the letter from his old place. You'll show it to the master? I ought to have done so on the instant. Oh, no, said Mrs. Gross with decision. I'll put it before him, I went on inexorably, that I can't undertake to work the question on behalf of a child who has been expelled. For we've never in the least known what, Mrs. Gross declared. For wickedness. For what else? When he's so clever and beautiful and perfect. Is he stupid? Is he untidy? Is he infirm? Is he ill-natured? He's exquisite. So it can only be that. And that would open up the whole thing. After all, I said, it's their uncle's fault. If he left here such people, he didn't really in the least know them. The fault's mine. She had turned quite pale. Well, you shan't suffer, I answered. The children shan't, she emphatically returned. I was silent a while. We looked at each other. Then what am I to tell him? You needn't tell him anything. I'll tell him. I measured this. Do you mean you'll write? Remembering she couldn't, I caught myself up. How do you communicate? I tell the bailiff. He writes. And should you like him to write our story? My question had a sarcastic force that I had not fully intended, and it made her, after a moment, inconsequently break down. The tears were again in her eyes. Ah, miss, you write. Well, tonight, I at last returned, and on this we separated. Chapter 17 I went so far in the evening as to make a beginning. The weather had changed back, a great wind was abroad, and beneath the lamp in my room with Flora at peace beside me, I sat for a long time before a blank sheet of paper and listened to the lash of the rain and the batter of the gusts. Finally I went out, taking a candle. I crossed the passage and listened a minute at Miles' door. What, under my endless obsession, I had been impelled to listen for was some betrayal of his not being at rest, and I presently caught one, but not in the form I had expected. His voice tinkled out. I say, you there, come in. It was gaiety in the gloom. I went in with my light and found him in bed, very wide awake, but very much at his ease. Well, what are you up to? He asked with a grace of sociability in which it occurred to me that Mrs. Gross, had she been present, might have looked in vain for proof that anything was out. I stood over him with my candle. How did you know I was there? Why, of course I heard you. Did you fancy you made no noise? You're like a troop of cavalry, he beautifully laughed. Then you weren't asleep? Not much. I lie awake and think. I had put my candle, designedly, a short way off, and then, as he held out his friendly old hand to me, he sat down on the edge of his bed. "'What is it,' I asked, "'that you think of?' "'What in the world, my dear, but you?' "'Ah, the pride I take in your appreci appreciation doesn't insist on that. I had so far rather you slept. "'Well, I think also, you know, of this queer business of ours.' I marked the coolness of his firm little hand. Of what 
queer business, Miles. Why, the way you bring me up, and all the rest. I fairly held my breath a minute, and even from my glimmering ta taper, there was light enough to show how he smiled up at me from his pillow. What do you mean by all the rest? Oh, you know, you know. I could say nothing for a minute, though I felt as I held his hand and our eyes continued to meet that my silence had all the air of admitting his charge and that nothing in the whole world of reality was perhaps at the moment so fabulous as our actual relation. Certainly you shall go back to school, I said, if it be that that troubles you, but not to that old place. We must find another, a better. How could I know it did trouble you, this question, when you never told me so? Never spoke of it at all. His clear listening face, framed in its smooth whiteness, made him for the minute as appealing as some wistful patient in a children's hospital. And I would have given, as the resemblance came to me, all I possessed on earth really to be the nurse or the sister of charity who might have helped to cure him. Well, even as it was, I perhaps might help. Do you know you've never said a word to me about your school? I mean the old one. Never mentioned it in any way. He seemed to wonder. He smiled with the same loveliness, but he clearly gained time. He waited. He called for guidance. Haven't I? It wasn't for me to help him. It was for the thing I had met. Something in his tone and the expression of his face, as I got this from him, set my heart aching with such a pang as it had never yet known. So unutterably touching was it to see his little brain puzzled and his little resources taxed to play under the spell laid on him a part of innocence and consistency. No, never. From the hour you came back, you've never mentioned to me one of your masters, one of your comrades, nor the least little thing that ever happened to you at school. Never, little Miles. No, never. Have you given me an inkling of anything that may have happened there? Therefore, you can fancy how much I'm in the dark. Until you came out that way this morning, you had since the first hour I saw you scarce even made a reference to anything in your previous life. You seem so perfectly to accept the present. It was extraordinary how my absolute conviction of his secret curiosity, or whatever I might call the poison of an influence that I dared but half phrase, made him, in spite of the faint breath of his inward trouble, appear as accessible as an older person forced me to treat him as an intelli intelligent equal. I thought you wanted to go on as you are. It struck me that at this he just faintly colored. He gave, at any rate, like a convalescent slightly fatigued, a languid shake of his head. I don't. I don't. I want to get away. You're tired of Bly? Oh, no. I like Bly. Well, then... Oh, you know what a boy wants. I felt I didn't know so well as Miles, and I took temporary refuge. You want to go to your uncle? Again at this, with his sweet, ironic face, he made a movement on the pillow. Ah, you can't get off with that. I was silent a little, and it was I now, I think, who changed color. My dear, I don't want to get off. You can even if you do. You can't, you can't. He lay beautifully staring. My uncle must come down and you must completely settle things. If we do, I returned with some spirit, you may be sure it will be to take you quite away. Well, don't you understand that's exactly what I'm working for? You'll have to tell him about the way you've let it all drop. You'll have to tell him a tremendous lot. The exultation with which he uttered this helped me somehow for the instant to meet him rather more. And how much will you, Miles, have to tell him? There are things he'll ask you. He turned it over. Very likely. But what things? The things you've never told me. To make up his mind what to do with you. He can't send you back. I don't want to go back, he broke in. I want a new field. He said it with admirable serenity with positive, unimpeachable gaiety, and doubtless it was that very note that most evoked for me the poignancy, the unnatural childish tragedy of his probable reappearance at the end of three months, with all this bravado and still more dishonor. It overwhelmed me now that I should never be able to bear that, and it made me let myself go. I threw myself upon him, and in the tenderness of my pity I embraced him. Dear little Miles, dear little Miles, 
My face was close to his, and he let me kiss him, simply taking it with indulgent good humor. Well, old lady, is there nothing, nothing at all that you would want to tell me? He turned off a little, facing round toward the wall and holding up his hand to look at one had seen sick children look. I told you, I told you this morning. Oh, I was so sorry for him that you just want me not to worry you. He looked round at me now as if in recognition of my understanding him, then ever so gently. To let me alone, he replied. There was even a strange little dignity in it, something that made me release him, yet, when I had slowly risen, linger beside him. God knows I never wished to har harass him, but I felt that merely at this, to turn my back on him was to abandon, or, to put it more truly, lose him. I've just begun a letter to your uncle, I said. Well then, finish it. I waited a minute. What happened before? He gazed up at me again. Before what? Before you came back and before you went away. For some time he was silent, but he continued to meet my eyes. What happened? It made me the sounds of the words in which it seemed to me I caught for the very first time a small faint waver of a consenting consciousness. It made me drop on my knees beside the bed and seize once more the chance of possessing him. Dear little Miles, dear little Miles, if you knew how I want to help you, it's only that, it's nothing but that, and I'd rather die than give you a pain or do you a wrong. I'd rather die than hurt a hair of you. Dear little Miles. Oh, I brought it out now even if I should go too far. I just want you to help me to save you. But I knew in a moment after this that I had gone too far. The answer to my appeal was instantaneous, but it came in the form of an extraordinary blast and chill, a gust of frozen air and a shake of the room as great as if, in the wild wind, the casement had crashed in. The boy gave a loud high shriek, which, lost in the rest of the shock of sound, might have seemed indistinctly, though I was so close to him, a note either of jubilation or of terror. I jumped to my feet again and was conscious of darkness. For, so for a moment we remained, while I stared about me and saw the drawn curtains unstirred and the window still tight. Why, the candle's out, I then cried. It was I who blew it, dear, said Miles. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Thanks for listening, and good night.